Well, welcome everyone. I um, usually I say at the beginning of a show, I am super excited to be part of this next podcast. But this time is different. This year has been a really challenging year and I'm tired and I know everyone else is tired. Everyone I speak to says I'm tired, I'm burnt out, I'm frustrated, um, I'm a little scared. And um, so what we've done today is we've put together this special live event. Um, this live event that's really about the gift of movement and how to put self-care on the top of your list. We're reaching the end of 2020, which has been an unbelievable challenging year and the challenges haven't stopped. We're taking one day at a time, but we have a lot of hope because we do see really the science coming out about the vaccine, but we still have some time before the impacts of that on our society are gonna allow us to return or begin a new kind of normal. But in the meantime, we have to take care of ourselves. And movement is a really, the science shows movement is a really important way of how we can take care of our bodies. So today I'm joined by three of my colleagues, three, of, three people who I would consider experts when it comes to movement, when it comes to musculoskeletal health. Today I'm joined by Dr. Kaylee Malroy, who's an orthopedic clinical specialist um, featured down in our southern part of the state. Um, Kaylee, as well as being a board certified clinical specialist, is also Newport Professionals Ballet Company's physical therapist. So she's a dancer and a physical therapist. I'm joined by Brendan Boyle, also a board certified clinical specialist. And he can run. He can run really, really fast, although he tells me he's not running so fast these days and he's using the pandemic as his excuse. And um, so he's a physical specialist as well as an expert in running, the science of running and doing running analysis and all things to do with running. And then because I know you all love accents, I've decided to bring a colleague from down, down under, Dr. Jordan Madigan. Jordan comes with being a very experienced clinician internationally and um, specializing in the orthopedic spine and sports physical therapy. So thank you, Brendan, Jordan, and Kaylee. I'm really happy that you're with us all. For people who are listening and listening live, we really hope this is potentially an interactive event. So please feel free to post your questions. In fact, what I'd love people to do is tell us if you're there. If you're here and listening, put something in the comments, whether you're on one of our social media chat forms, platforms. Tell us what town you're in. Give us any questions, but we wanna know that people are listening and how we can help you move better and feel healthier. So let's start with some questions that I have. And I've decided, ladies first, that Kaylee can go first. So Kaylee, compared to a year ago, you're used to seeing patients, you've seen them for multiple different kinds of diagnosis. Compared to a year ago, um, what are some of the biggest changes and challenges that you're seeing that people in our community currently are having? Thank you, Michelle. That's a that's a really great question. Um, you know, as PTs, our, our job is to find the patient's story. Um, and patient stories a year ago was really about their physical pain. Um, there's always a little underlayer of emotional, mental things going on. But physical pain was really the, the forefront and it would rehab pretty quickly. But now there is an added um, layer or layers, I call it layers of the onion that we have to, um, that we have to address. And I find myself talking with my patients more now than I did before and educating them on pain and that whole vicious cycle that it causes with depression and stress. And it just keeps looping and looping around. And if you don't interrupt that cycle, you're not going to get anywhere. So that's the biggest change I've seen. So it sounds like you're saying that patients are a little more complicated now, or maybe our lives are just more complicated um, dealing with this pandemic. So as a physical therapist, what kinds of advice do you give your patients when they're telling you, oh my goodness, I'm stressed, or how am I gonna get through this pandemic and my back hurts more than ever? Do you think patients understand the relationship and how do you help people understand the relationship between stress or depression, anxiety, and pain? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I relate to them. We all have a story right now and everyone has a slightly different story. We know whether there's a personal loss in the family or something like that, but just relating to the person's the first thing. And 
I think it's really just telling them, look, okay, there's time, you have to take time for yourself and self care. And that's really the whole point of this podcast today is taking care of ourselves through this challenging time. And I, you give them the tips of take five minutes and just breathe for five minutes, you know, close the door, get away from the noise and the distractions and away from the computer, away from distracting social media, you know, just take that five minutes for yourself, you know, make sure you're eating well, make sure you go outside and walk for 10 minutes, just do something for yourself. Um, and then the biggest other thing is I just do a lot of education and at every single visit, it's following up what we talked about before and saying, this is what we talked about last time. Like, are you understanding it? What do you need help with? You know, what can I do? I just offer as much as I can to the person. I just saw some people down in um, Newport that are listening to you. So it's nice to see that. Nice to hear from George. Hi, everyone. Um, and yes, please keep telling us where you are and let us know what you're doing to help manage your health and your pain and your stress during the pandemic. One last question, um, Kaylee, before I jump on to one of our gentlemen here. Um, what are you doing for yourself? You're a frontline worker, you're a healthcare provider. You have not taken a break. You went <laughs> from in the clinic in March to flipping to doing, seeing everyone via telehealth and figuring out how to do that in March to gradually coming back to the clinic and now doing a hybrid of both. Um, how are you managing your stress levels? Great question. Um, I'll admit there were moments I wasn't managing my stress levels. There's been a lot of change and learning how to deal with a lot of change all at once is tough. But the biggest piece is making sure I get enough sleep. But in order to do that, I have to take some time before bed to actually like kind of decompress. I'm not sitting in front of the television, you know, you know, stimulating my mind. I'm just trying to find quiet time. And the other thing is exercise. Like I got back, you know, to working out in a safe manner. Um, and, you know, whether it's outside or it's in a private room with no one else near me and just getting those endorphins going. Um, and whether it's stretching or it's a little 10 minute calisthenic workout or core anything, it just, I come out of it. And I just feel like I finally have a glow around me again. But it fluctuates month by month, week by week. And I just listen to my body and I just say, okay, you've got to do this for yourself. I like the Kaylee glow. You always have a glow. And I, I've seen you straight after exercising and you glow a little brighter. Um, you talked about that 10 minutes of calisthenics. What is calisthenics for the listeners out there who are like, what is this fancy term that this physical therapist is talking about? <laughs> it's really just getting uh, getting yourself moving, getting your heart rate up, um, you know, jumping jacks, um, just getting yourself warmed up for exercise. And jumping jacks happens to be one of my top warm up exercises I do to get the heart rate going and just get your body ready to move. Um, doesn't have to be anything complicated. Yeah. Well, great. I love the jumping jacks idea. And I love the fact that you say exercise and movement actually doesn't have to be complicated. We can actually really simplify it and see the benefits from it. Brenda, let's jump over to you. Should we go for Brendan or George? Let's jump over to Brendan. Brendan's on the top of my screen. So, um, you know, therefore, he's on the top of my list right at the moment. Do you think that um, the patients that you're seeing or the people in the community that you're working with, are people truly seeing this association and understand the association between stress and, and I'm going to put depression and anxiety, which is sort of all kicking in there with the stress. Do you think people truly understand and respect the relationship between that and exercise? Um, I would say that a lot of people, I guess, would be aware of that in the sense if you told them, hey, your stress like can really improve if you exercise, people will say, of course, I know that, like that makes sense. But I think the, the big disconnect that I've been working on with a lot of people that I'm seeing is trying to actually get that on the forefront of their minds. So they're trying to take an active role in preventing the stress and anxiety from cropping up in the first place instead of like, feeling completely overwhelmed and then trying to add a new habit on top of that. It's always easier to have good habits in place and really appreciate them for the effect they're having um, instead of trying to be more reactive. So I, I think we can do, or we at least here in our, in our clinic and at performance, we're trying to like do the work to push that to the forefront of people's minds. Um, 
So I think it's it's an important thing that instead of just being like, yeah, of course that makes sense to to take an active role and, and try and um, really prevent the stress and anxiety from coming in the first place. I really like what you said then. You're saying take an active role in prevention. Use exercise to take an active role in prevention rather than using exercise as an intervention for dealing with stress. So you're really using it as a preventative me method and being in control because it's something you can be in control with. Tell us about you. What are you doing to manage your stress levels? Um, well, luckily for me, my main method of exercising was just running to begin with. So I haven't been all that affected in terms of my ability to get out there in terms of gyms closing or, or things like that. Like, I, you know, you don't need a ton of equipment. Um, it helps if you have a treadmill when the weather's terrible or I don't know, it's one o'clock right now. The sun's about to set like this, this time of year. So, um, but I've been trying to make sure I don't skip workouts and things like that it's it's getting crazy in the clinics it's been like that kind of the whole time so trying to make sure I'm, I'm staying on top of it um i think i'm fortunate in the sense that i didn't need to find a new way to exercise um but just really making sure that i'm sticking to it because i you know before there was always a race on the schedule with a long-term goal and right now everything's been kind of thrown into uncertainty where I don't even know when the next time I'm going to run an organized race is again. So it, I've, I've been trying to keep the consistency and motivation, even if there's not like a tangible kind of midterm goal to work towards. Now, that's a really key point you bring up because there's many athletes out there who have goals and have events, and that's what keep, keeps them motivated. Any advice or strategies that you have for athletes, whether they're runners or other kinds of athletes who used to have the the date on the calendar as a reason to go and train. And now they don't have a date on their calendar. What techniques can, can people use to keep them motivated to run or work out or exercise if they don't have this event in the future? So I, I would say, you know, there now I guess there are some like virtual races you could do. I, I think for me, that doesn't really, really do it for, for me in terms of like, oh, this is something I'm going to like, you know, train my guts out for. But I do think if you if you have that very competitive mindset, um, and that's really the the only way you can really find that drive. Um, I think especially if you're trying to train, I, I guess this more applies to people training at a higher level, like, set a date on the calendar and say, you know, on, you know, January 20th, I'm going to do a 5000 meter time trial, I'm going to run 100% effort, I'm going to try and do this. And then you know, I'm going to let myself recover. I'm going to set like a good amount of time to get a good full training cycle in, you know, which I would say at least 12 weeks, 20 weeks, if you're doing like a, you know, competitive race um, and say, okay, I want to see how much I can improve my time in that, in that 12 to, to 20 weeks. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a race. It's kind of not because you, you know, there's no one else around the whole strategy of racing or, or something like that. Uh, kind of goes away, but you at least have a goal to beat. And you could do this for, for really any sport. You know, let's say you're lifting weights. You can say, I'm going to max out on these lifts. I'm going to set a training program and then I'm going to see, you know, so that way you're at least competing against yourself. And there's still some level of accountability there if you set a date in advance of where you need to kind of hit those goals. Well, I think you break out some great points because you said, write it down. We all know we're much more likely to, to meet a goal if we write it down. Um, you also tell someone about it because if you tell people and verbalize what your goals are, it is much more likely for you to be accountable. So these are almost like New Year's resolutions as well. Like make a goal, like be disciplined to make a goal, write it down and tell people. Now a side story is last week we were doing a prep call for this and um, I asked Brendan, I asked you about your running and you're like, yeah, I'm going to try run a half marathon. And you know, and now we followed up today to say, yeah, you did run a half marathon and you mapped it out on your um, phone through Strava. You ran with your brother. And I think, and maybe you wouldn't have done that whether you told me or not, but again, making these plans and getting them on your schedule so that you have a purpose and you have a goal are really important ways for us to keep moving through this challenging time. 
Um, and that's a, those are just all different tips and they'll work in different ways for different people, but find things that will motivate you to keep you moving. And a lot of the time that means telling people about them, it means writing them down and setting really objective goals. Hey, I'm gonna lift this much weight on this day, or I'm gonna run this distance, and I'm gonna try run at this pace on this date because these are all the structured things that will help to manage and help to prevent some of the stress and some of the challenges that we have. All right, Jordan, my friend from down under, people say I sound uh, like sound like an Australian when I talk and now they're all going to discover that that's actually completely wrong, that you actually sound like a Kiwi is what the issue is. I get asked if I'm on the voicemail system at the phone, on the phone all the time. You do? So I'm they like, do that's not they, me. I'm they, sorry. They sound like a girl. <laughs> or you sound like a guy. So I don't know what that's oh, yeah, that. either, either one, isn't it? <laughs> but no, that is not me for everyone out there. <laughs> so tell us, Jordan, tell us about what you're doing. Is what What's your story when it comes to um, incorporating exercise into your into your life? And then let's hear about how you're helping your patients, especially when it comes to the how you're utilizing exercise to manage your stress levels. I'd like to hear what you're doing, but I'd like to hear like what suggestions you have about what kinds of exercise. Is there a certain frequency? Is there a certain duration? What is an individual, how much do they have to do to combat or prevent some of the um, ailments related to stress and depression that we're seeing people deal with because of this COVID, well, I'm going to call it sort of COVID fatigue. And it's not the fatigue because of COVID, it's the fatigue from thinking and being in a pandemic. And I'm sure we're all pretty tired of COVID. So there, that's yeah. where that fatigue comes in. But um, yeah, a lot of questions there. So throw more at me if I, if I miss anything. I think one of the biggest things I tell a lot of my patients is have a divide between work and home. And I think a lot of times, especially people working from home and even me working from home with telehealth, you you don't have that drive to work. You don't have that time to sort of, you know, decompress after work, listen to a podcast, listen to some music. You sort of walk out of one room and into another and you can always go back in, check some emails, do a little bit of extra work. And before you know it, you're working, you know, 20 hours a day and just not finding time to do other things. So one thing I'm really telling a lot of patients and really trying to do myself is, having a separate room to, to be able to do any of your work from home. Once you leave that room, your, your work is done. You might go back in for a quick little bit just to do something, but you're not, you're not in and out, you're leaving it. And then that's the same with exercise. You're finding a, a space for your exercise that you know, this is, this is my space. This is where I can be me and do my thing. And that way then you're not, your brain isn't going in 10 different directions. You can actually decompress and, and have some time to do that. Um, and I'm very lucky you asked sort of one of the things I'm doing a lot. Um, in February, we, we built a little gym in our basement with a with squat rack and dumbbells and, and everything. We were very lucky that just before all the gyms closed down, we had that. And so to be able to still work out during COVID when the gyms were closed and, and do different programs, I think was very beneficial for my mental health to be able to be upstairs in my, in my spare room to do all my telehealth with patients and then be able to sh shut that door, walk downstairs, go and work out and be able to, you know, feel some form of normalcy with that made me feel a, a little bit better. Um, and I know it's a lot tougher for some people at, at home when you're getting pulled in different directions, kids at home, that type of thing. But I think, you know, my biggest thing to patients is have some dedicated time for, for work, for, for exercise, so that you can not feel like you're being pulled in multiple directions. Um, we know that exercise is extremely important. Exactly what, what Brendan was saying for for mental health and, and depression, anxiety. One thing that I remember from my first year of undergraduate university um, was a um, was a lecturer saying to me, prevention is better than treatment. If you put a, a fence at the top of the cliff as opposed to an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, you're gonna save so many more people. And so if you can stop yourself or prevent yourself getting as worked up or as stressed, you're gonna mitigate all those long-term things that come later down the track that unfortunately we're seeing a lot of at the moment. Gyms being closed, people not coming to PT as often as they like. We're, we're starting to see people with two, three, four injuries, chronic overuse injuries or posture-related injuries. 
as opposed to them coming for their their one thing that their shoulder that they see is four to six weeks for and then they're gone we don't see them for another year it's four or five things at a time because people are not making time for themselves so i'm um, i guess really advocating for patients to to take time for themselves to do that and to find three four five times a week to go out and do some exercise walk take the dog for a walk meditate download that so many more apps that have come out with uh, with meditation mindfulness just to take some time for yourself so that we're on where they're not having to see you for three or four or five things in in one caseload we're able to to see you for your one thing that you may need to be seen for and then you're you're out looking after yourself gosh i really love your, I, I love what your um professor said about the fence and the ambulance what a great analogy and I really love the fact that you're talking about this almost compartmentalizing the space that you do your work versus your family time versus your exercise. And you can do the same with your schedule and your time. And we see from the studies that we all manage stress and that will ultimately help our ability to manage our musculoskeletal health. We all manage, um, we all, we all manage that better when we've got that structure. And um, structure is really helpful for all of us, especially at times um, at times of challenges. What um, I'm curious, I've heard people talk about meditation. I've heard jumping jacks. I've heard running. I've heard walking. I've heard my gym downstairs. And I hear lots of people say like, oh, you know, what exercise should I do? If I kept to choose, should I stretch? Should I meditate? Should I go for a walk? Um, should I work on some yoga? Jordan, is there a magical combination? Or if someone was to say, you know, I, I've got 30 minutes put aside to exercise four days a week. What should I be? What's the biggest bang for my buck? What should I be doing on those four days? That is the million dollar question. And that's why we're all here, isn't it? Um, I think <laughs> one one thing I take out of that and I, I read this from a, a guy I follow on, on Facebook, Adam Meekins, he's the, the sports physio over in the UK. He says, working is not working out. You can you know, shift rocks, you can garden all day, you can do these things, but you're not elevating your heart rate enough to be considered exercise or working out. Now, so even if you've had a hard day at work, trying to find 20, 30, 45 minutes of dedicated time to be raising your heart rate and to be able to actually work out and have time to have your brain thinking about something else is absolutely invaluable. So, I mean, you, you've used the example of four times a week. Cross training is something that we're, we know is extremely important in terms of not just doing the, the same thing every time, trying to get your body to adapt to different stresses. Um, so cardiovascular activities such as walking, jumping jacks, calisthenics, but also finding a little bit of time for resistance training, whether it be light band work, whether it's body weight work at home, isometric work using a wall or, or, or a towel, or so many different things that you're probably going to see in our um, in our videos that we're posting. Um, any, I would say any form of exercise that is elevating your heart rate and stressing your body to be able to, you know, better yourself is better than nothing. And then in alternate times, trying to find some time to exercise your brain as well. So that's where that uh, even yoga, mindfulness, meditation comes in just to get your brain thinking about something else as well. Yeah, great point. So I love the fact that you've talked about the cross training, the combination, and that's what we talk a lot about is about it's not just cardiovascular. So Brendan, you have to do a little bit more than run. Um, and it's not just about yoga and um, stretching. So Kaylee, maybe you should go for a run. And Jordan, who's basically told us before that he only runs when it's sunny outside, he could probably go for a run with you. But I think we all have the things that we like to do. And, and I think helping the individuals out there realize we all, some people prefer a run or a walk. Some people prefer yoga and some stretching or mindfulness, but really a combination, a little bit of all of them is what's best. And, and challenging yourself to do five minutes of mindfulness it might be really hard. It's really hard for someone like me. It's the last thing in the world that I want to do. But if I do it, I kind of like, oh, I think I kind of feel good. I feel a little better. That headache I had is sign of subsided. I feel a little more relaxed. 
Um, so challenging yourself to try these different things. I'm curious for your top three. So I want each of you to think about your top three exercises. If we have people listening out there going, oh, now I don't know what to do. Do I run? Do I squat? You know, do I do a warrior pose? You know, what's my top three exercises that I should do? So we'll go Brendan, Kaylee, Jordan. Brendan, what are your top three exercises that you love and that you recommend that everyone in the entire world does? All right. Well, I guess I like to stick in the, uh, you know, where, where my mind's at is I like to choose some exercises that at least even if I'm not running, they might help me with running. So um, actually these are three exercises um, that we actually recorded for our kind of pause and progress. So uh, maybe we can get some videos up there of these exercises. I think um, the first one that's really good is a stretch, a hip flexor stretch. Um, with the hip flexor stretch, it's, it's really important for us to open those hips up because if we're sitting a long time, which I know a lot of people um, are working at home at a desk, but even in our leisure time, we're sitting watching TV, you know, those hip flexors can get pretty tight. So uh, we can see in the video here, um, the handsome man talking about our uh, models here doing the hip flexor stretches. On the right here, uh, Zane's doing a standing hip flexor stretch. He's stretching his right leg there. You're kind of doing a lunge forward, keeping the leg that you're stretching behind you. Jordan's doing the half kneeling version, which if your knees can tolerate that, I, I prefer this version. It's a little bit easier to do where you're just kind of kneeling down and tucking your hips underneath you, squeezing those glute muscles to push those hips forward. Um, I think it's a really important exercise to not only help with how flexible your hips are, but everything's connected here. So if our hip flexors are flexible, that's gonna help our pelvis and our lower back stay in a better position um, when we do, um, when we're doing any activity really, standing, walking, running, or even just, you know, day-to-day -day activities. So. The hip flexor stretch, I would say, is definitely an important one. Um, another stretch that we did was our uh, ankle dorsiflexion mobility stretch. So ankle dorsiflexion, um, at basically how it works in everyday function is just getting your leg being able to um, progress over your foot. So if your foot's planted on the ground, your leg's progressing over it. Um, this is good for, for running, but also really good for walking. If you're going downstairs, you need a lot of dorsiflexion. So if your ankles are really tight and painful, um, this is a good stretch to do. So right now, um, that was a test for dorsiflexion. This is how you could work on your dorsiflexion. So I'm, I'm working my left leg right here. Um, I'm trying to progress my knee as far forward as I can while keeping my foot flat. Um, this is an exercise you could do on a chair or if uh, the chair is too high. You could use a step, like do it on your first stair. Uh, the modification we're showing here is if that is actually too easy, you can add a towel. You get it right in the crease on the front of your ankle and pull backwards. Um, so that provides a little bit of a stretch to, to the ankle joint itself, um, in addition to stretching all the muscles that might limit your dorsiflexion if they're really tight. And here we go back and we're, we're retesting again. Uh, this is a good way for you to see if you have good ankle dorsiflexion you know, you get away from a, uh, a fist length away from the wall um, and try and touch the wall without letting your heel lift up. Um, if you can't do that, then you can do that uh, ankle dorsiflexion stretch. Um, so that's that's another good one to work on. And then uh, just so we're not working all um, stretching, if I can only choose one more exercise, I'm going to go with uh, the exercise that most physical therapists will choose, which is a squat, because it can work so many different things, and there's so many different variations of squats that you can do. Um, but again, if we're sitting in a chair all day, those glutes uh, on the backside of our hips are in a lengthened position, which isn't very good for their strength. So you could do something as simple as an air squat. Jordan just started doing one there on the right. Um, Zane here on the left is doing an actual little bit of easier version. He's using the bench, but you could just as easily do that in a chair, um, a sit to stand, um, making sure that you're letting yourself come down nice and slow and controlled. Jordan here again on the right is doing a great job of keeping his knees from progressing too far forward. If we do that, we rely a little bit too much on our quads and we're not getting our glutes involved enough. Um, and I know that 
this video here just kind of shows us a basic squat, but there are a bunch of different squat variations that you could do a squat um, on an unstable surface. And all of a sudden we're working our, uh, our ankle, knee, hip, and core stability. Um, we can, you know, get one leg in front of the other uh, in kind of a lunge position and do a split squat. Um, and, and, you know, you can find as many squat variations as you'd want to. Um, you could go a, a whole month not doing the same squat exercise if you did a squat exercise every day. Um, it's just, you know, you can change based off what you want to work on. But if we're just doing a standard squat, like in this video, we know we're working a lot of different areas, hips, knees, ankles, and core. Um, so I would say those definitely are my top three, um, but also my sh shorter answer, you know, if you're saying what exercises should I do is like, it's probably not good to only do three exercises, but I'd say these are my favorites. I love all of those exercises. I did pull up my spine here because I don't think when you talk about a hip flexor stretch and you think that, yeah, it's really good for, for runners and people who sit all day, I don't think people realize the hip flexor, the here's looking at your spine from inside and the front and the hip flexor muscles in the front, and it's a big muscle, it attaches onto your actual spine. It attaches onto your spine and all to the front of your pelvis, and then runs down the front of your leg onto the front of your hip. It's a really big, powerful muscle, and it's a muscle that gets really tight and then causes major problems on your hip, your whole pelvic girdle, as well as your low back. So uh, I'm with you, Brendan, on that vote for a hip flexor stretch. Maybe we actually have a vote at the end of this to say what's the number one exercise. But hip flexor stretch to me is one of the key ones that we should all be doing because of the lifestyles that we lead. Um, and it, it's just, it, it causes many, many problems. Love the squat. And for those who want those variations, we have this every day, a video coming out called Through Our Pause and Progress series, where all of these exercises are featured. So every day there's a new exercise coming out. So you get to see this whole variety um, of, of things coming out. So let's jump to Kaylee. Kaylee, what are your top three? Oh, you're muted, Kaylee. All right. All right. We're back. Okay. So I mentioned jumping jacks um, being one of my favorites. I'll do that in a second, but I want to start with planks. Um, planks are really good. I have a video of it that will queue up in a minute, but planks are great and you can do them separate several ways. And here's Nick, um, my awesome assistant showing a regular floor plank from the forearms. Um, really good for core stability, shoulder stability. Um, it really uses everything. I mean, you can tweak it in certain ways that can get your lats going, your glutes, your quads. I'm demonstrating it from the knees um, if you're not quite ready to go up to the full plank. I'm also demonstrating that you shouldn't lift your hips up too much. Now, Nick is also showing a hand plank, so tall plank that's going to get a little bit more in the shoulders, a little bit different challenge. Um, if you aren't ready to be on the floor, you can always do it from a, an incline, a surface, um, just to make sure, you know, if you have shoulder pain, you don't want to put yourself in pain to do this, but I just showed the norms as well. That was kind of quick. Um, but that's my first and favorite one I do almost oh, every day. Oh, well, I have a quick question. How long can you play um, for? Okay. Number, yeah. uh, right now, 60 we'll, seconds, we'll, I'd we'll say. We'll from Brendan and Jordan <laughs> in a moment to see I how long a, they can play for. So, how long can you plank for? I'd love to hear people put in the comments. How long can you plank for? All right, sorry to butt in, Kaylee. No, it's okay. It's more like, how long do you want? To, do I want to hold the plank for? Sixty seconds. <laughs> All right. Um, second one, um, hamstring stretch. The, I, this goes back to my dancing days. I mean, hamstrings are so important for dancer flexibility. So I'll do a quick demonstration. Um, all right, so we're gonna go like this. So I like to put my foot up on a surface right here. I keep the chest tall, so if I'm looking like this, like that, leaning forward, not collapsing forward like this, but keep the back nice and flat, making sure that spine isn't hogging the stretch. You hold that for 30 seconds. You can also go toe out, get a little more inner thigh or toe in, get a little more outer thigh, or you can do it seated, simply like this. Leg out in front of you, lean forward. 
And there's that. <laughs> All right, and then I have one more, and that will be the prone push-ups and extensions. So like Brenda alluded to, we are seeing, you know, we are sitting a lot more, low back hurts more. Um, so this exercise is great. And you can do it lying down or standing. So if you just bear with me a moment, put that right there, get down on the floor, forearms here, you can arch back like this. If you have the mobility and you're not in any pain, you can go all the way up. So you got a nice arch in your back and you can do that 10 times, get a little tricep work there too. And then you can also stand up and do it simply like this. A little over pressure and then get back to sitting down and doing your work. All right, any questions there? Awesome. I love them, Kaylee, and I, I, it's actually from back in my days when I first trained to be a physio, which is well over 20 years ago, um, the whole um, theory about the prone push-up or the upward dog or cobra, whatever you want to call it, um, that was really when the science first came out about how important that was for overall spine health, especially when it relates to the discs, because we spend so much time in this forward flex position. Um, so I know that I've always incorporated that prone push up into something I do every single day. And, um, and it's on my top 10 list as well, like something that you should do every single day to optimize the ongoing mobility of your spine and keep it healthy. So, and it's not, and something too that I think people often with back pain think, oh, I shouldn't move, I've hurt my back. Um, I would say movement is medicine. So if your back is hurting, that prone push-up is one of the top things, as long as you're not exacerbating the symptoms and making them worse and causing symptoms into your leg, but an ache in your back is fine. But I could just about guarantee that if you did repeated push-ups, the prone push-ups, as you demonstrated, you are going to manage and actually help to optimize your mobility and decrease the pain that you're experiencing in your back. If everyone with acute back pain did that straight away, we would see a lot less people in the emergency rooms, doctor's offices, and physical therapy practices if you just did that straight away and went for a walk. Anyway, thank What's you, <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a New Zealander with the yeah, Mackenzie method. <laughs> Jordan, what are your top three? Of course. And I just want to say, I think Kaylee just showed us a pretty good uh, insight into how we're doing telehealth at home a little bit with sort of having to maneuver things and jump on the floor and show our patients different things. So uh, people who are watching at the moment are sort of getting a, an insight into how we're doing telehealth a little bit. So welcome into our houses. But um, so similar to what um, Brendan and Kaylee were saying with people sitting a lot, we've looked at the front of the hips. Kaylee just showed the prone press up with uh, with the lower back. And I want to look into a little bit of the, the thoracic spine with us getting into more of that rounded shoulder on the computer. So the thing that I really love to do is if we're on a, a rolling chair, moves around, so normal desk chair, just getting your hands behind your head and getting your hands on the desk, pressing with your feet through the ground, and then just pushing yourself back and getting a really nice stretch through your back. So as you push your hips back, you're getting a nice stretch through your upper back. Sometimes you can look up a little bit, sometimes down, depending what your neck feels like, and then coming through. And so you're feeling that nice stretch through here and hopefully getting ourselves out of here and more into that nice upright posture as we're able to, to work a little better through there. Variations, we can do this on the wall as well. Um, but the way I really like this, and, and I give this to most of my, my shoulder, neck, and upper back patients, just you know, 10 times holding it for five seconds, we wanna aim for 45 to 60 seconds total to do this exercise, just getting that nice stretch. And we can also do that standing against the wall if you don't have a rolling chair. So, I'm not sure if they're actually called rolling chairs, but that's what I'm going to call them. But as you're against the wall, you're doing the exact same thing, just sliding your elbows up and down the wall. So if I'm coming from the side, you're getting that nice extension through the thoracic spine. And if you're feeling it too much in the lower back, you may be getting a little too much of that hip thrust through here. Um, my second one... Um, 
a lot of people who aren't in gyms at the moment are you know struggling to find weight they're saying how can i how can i spot how can i deadlift brendan's just shown us some great exercises with spotting and like he said they're you know probably an exercise every day that you could do a different with but i want to show people a little bit about how they can add some resistance to a deadlift without actually having any weight at home um, so in the clinic we only have small towels here but if you've got a beach towel or a towel at home you can use that to add a little bit of resistance. What I'm going to do here, I've got a pillowcase and a towel, and that's how inventive we're being at the moment. And I'm just going to stand on each of those, and I'm going to move that up just a little. And all I'm going to do here is I'm in that sort of Romanian deadlift position through here, and I'm just holding on to the towels. Now, if I'm heavy enough through here, I'm not going to be able to pull these towels up so I'm going to get a nice resistance here through the backs of my legs and into my lower back as I'm trying to straighten my legs and push myself up. I'm not arching my back here. I'm not rounding down here trying to tug up with my lower back. I'm trying to pull myself up and hold for a few seconds. So from this position, here's how I'm looking here. I've got the towel underneath. If I want to bend over more, I've got my hands down a little lower. If I'm up a little higher, I'm then not bending anywhere near as much through there. So you can work your way through a whole range of positions through here based on where you're where you're holding yourself through here. So exercise two, and I'm already a little bit out of breath, so I need to do more of those. Um, the, the third exercise I had here is the lunges, so I think we may have a, a video for our lunges. We've got Brendan here demonstrating, or talking about myself and Zane demonstrating the lunges. The way I'm demonstrating them on the on the side here against the chair is how I talk to a lot of my older population to say, this is a functional exercise for getting down to the ground. So can you bend your knees and put weight through your right leg or your left leg to be able to get down to the ground to make sure you can pick something up and safely get back up? Zane's got his foot up on a chair or a bench, so you can make this exercise a lot harder. We can add a little bit of a stretch if Zane pushed his hips a little bit further forward. And depending what leg he's got more weight through, his back leg or his front leg, you can look at biasing different different areas of your body. So again, just like the squat, there are so many different ways we can make this exercise easier, harder. You can change how deep you're going. You can change your tempo. You can hold it. You can put your leg up on different things. So just a really good lower body exercise to be able to um, throw into your routine a couple of times a week. And again, you're sitting and you're waiting for the microwave. You've got 90 seconds for that packet rice ready for your dinner. He's holding next to the bench and you're just going up and down. You say, hey, I've just completed 20 or 30 lunges. Great. And now I can put my cards in. Well, what, again, I'm going to put together exercises because we're adding in Kaylee's jumping jacks. We've got a top 10 exercise list that includes some really important core lower extremity strengthening, as well as flex flexibility, spine mobility, um, movements that are gonna help anyone's body function at a higher level. So I think it's a um, amazing list. So thank you for all of those things. Now, Jordan, you mentioned um, a, a term that not pe many people like to hear, and that's that one called carbs. And I've heard people talk about the, um, you know, COVID-15, the 15 pounds that they've put on during a pandemic as they enjoy eating comfort food. Um, holiday seasons are ahead of us when we all usually get, get a little worried about those holiday pounds from all the goodies that we're sneaking. Um, let's jump over to you, Brendan. What are your thoughts on how you combat the, um, how you combat nutrition, weight management, exercise, um, what, what are some key tips that you have for your patients and for the public out there as they battle this like, oh, I've got nothing else to do but eat. I can't exercise the way that I used to. I'm stressed and I have the holidays coming up and I can't fit into my cute pants that I want to wear. So I, I would say there are a few different areas you would need to look at for, for weight management. Um, obviously the the first one that comes to mind is diet so um i personally would recommend pretty much anyone to to maybe stay away from the kind of crash diets or fad diets because it 
what we really want to do when we're talking about managing our weight is not just losing it, but then maintaining it. Or, you know, uh, conversely, if we're a little bit underweight, like doing the right things to gain that weight and maintain it instead of just trying to trend in one direction, then all of a sudden you don't know what to do. So I would say the, the first thing is, um, is your diet. And I think it needs to be sustainable. So again, it's, it's not very easy, but you know, we want to develop good habits. So, um, I think one of the links you sent out to us, uh, Michelle, with the, um, the Harvard school of public health, the healthy eating plate picture, I think is like perfect because it, it breaks things down really, really simply about like how the, the, you should have a good mixture of, healthy oils, water, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and, and healthy proteins, um, which um, I think that would be, you know, a good baseline to say, okay, what types of food should I be eating and in what proportions? Um, because a lot of people, when they want to lose weight, they start, they start running or they start uh, meeting with a personal trainer. But I, I would say, you know, exercise is fantastic, but you can't necessarily out exercise a, a bad diet if you're you're consuming too much or you're not consuming the right uh, types of calories too. Um, and then just as important as diet though, even though I'm, I literally just said you can't out exercise a bad diet is you do want to have um, a good exercise routine, um, not only for your weight, but your cardiovascular health as well. Um, you know, I believe the uh, American College of Sports Medicine recommends, you know, if you do 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise five days a week, that's a good goal to shoot for. If you're doing more intense exercise, I believe it's it's only 20 minutes three times a week. So you can kind of pick your poison there. Um, but making sure you're doing some type of exercise. Um, I think it's kind of a, a myth that you have to do cardio to lose weight. I mean, you, I, I would say, if you're doing some type of exercise though, you know, whether it's strength or, or cardio, you should be doing exercise, you know, at least three to five times per week um, and making sure that you're, you're doing that for the benefits of your metabolism. So you might burn more calories doing a cardio workout than a weightlifting workout, but there is some um, evidence out there that shows your, your metabolism, uh, your metabolic level stays elevated after a weightlifting workout a little bit longer than a cardio workout. So not that it exactly evens out, but cho choose what kind of workout you want to do um, so you can stay consistent as well. Um, so between, you know, having the, the right amount of diet or, or the right amount of calories and the right composition of your diet and, and exercising, I would say those are the, the two most important things um, for weight management, especially with the holidays coming up, being conscientious about, um, you know, making sure you're getting enough food. You don't want to like skip meals because you you think that, you know, you need to make up for it on, you know, on Christmas, you're going to eat a ton. So don't eat anything on Christmas Eve. I would avoid that. I think in the weeks leading up, get yourself into those good, healthy habits in terms of consuming the right amount of calories, the right composition of those calories, because then it becomes more second nature and it's not something you have to force yourself to do. Great points. The other thing I like about exercise is that um, and I know I'll use it, you know, when you're stressed and when you're bored, some one of the things, well, not so much bored, maybe stressed is one of the things many people say, well, then it leads me to eat. And I was like, well, instead of eating, go for a walk. Like, do some movement instead. Like, take control and choose to do an alternative thing to manage how you're feeling. Choose to do something that's more healthy. Um, Kaylee, any tips on what you would recommend as some really healthy tips for lunches or breakfasts or, or you know what do you do to make sure that you stay in your super healthy perfect body? <laughs> it's not perfect <laughs> it is perfect but it's good enough for me <laughs> um all right yeah i mean piggybacking off of what brendan said he hit some really good points but i start every morning with a glass of water eight ounces of water and I definitely can tell a difference when I miss that glass of water in the morning. I don't know. It's like a little jump start for me, whether it's a squeeze of lemon or a lime in it just to give it some flavor. But they, they say it gets your metabolism going too. Um, and it's, and then I'll have like a hard boiled egg or something. Um, and drinking that water can almost like trick your body into saying, Oh, I actually have something in me and I'm not super hungry. You're not craving that egg and cheese croissant from Dunkin' Donuts. Yes, I admit I have gone that direction sometimes, <laughs> but I really try to stick with that water and that hard boiled egg or like a egg whites omelet with uh, spinach or something like that. Um, 
you know, at lunch, I try to stick with a salad and some sort of lean protein. So chicken, fish, um, you know, I, I kind of like the 80, 20 model, like, you know, eat well, 80% of the time and 20% of the time you can have that, that slip. Um, but just keep yourself accountable and make sure that you um, are staying consistent, you know, every day, every week. And I also notice that when I eat better, I have better energy throughout the day. I have better focus. My patients benefit from that. And then I also sleep better. Sleep is so important. And let's admit, I mean, all of our anxiety has been extremely high this year. And I've had some insomnia myself. And I realized like if I have my meals and my workout schedule in order more, I sleep a lot better. Yeah. Isn't it funny how they all piggyback off each other and we've jumped from exercise we've brought up some mindfulness, we've brought up nutrition, and now we've jumped on to sleep and we don't have too much time left. So let's jump over to Jordan. Let's hear from you, your 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 key tips when it comes to um, nutrition and um, management, but also to the sleep side of things. Of course. Um, I think one of the, well, the important things I tell a lot of my patients is don't be afraid of carbs because our brains need carbs to function so we completely cut that out you're not only going to get the COVID fatigue you're just going to get the brain fog and fatigue as well um, something that really really helps me is planning my meals like on a Saturday or a Sunday or you know whatever day it is during COVID because the days don't seem to matter as much but I'll sit there and I'll, I'll cook enough chicken for the week I'll cook a meal that'll last three or four nights and so I know that I'm not going to get on Uber Eats or Grubhub I'm not going to call past somewhere on the way home from work and pick up some trash because I've got a perfectly healthy meal at home and I know that I'm getting a carb, a, a protein and, and a good group of fats in, in all of my meals with the right proportions. Um, yes, sometimes I sit there and put my food on the scales, but sometimes I don't and I know roughly what I need. But it's, uh, I think, similar to what Brendan was talking about earlier with being able to plan your exercise and strive towards something. I think planning out your meals might take you 30 minutes on a Sunday and it helps you with your shopping list, but it also helps you throughout the week not, you know, dive into the, the cookie jar or, or eat things you don't want to be eating because you've everything already got everything already mapped out. In terms of sleep, I think Kaylee touched on it a little earlier as well as really making sure that you set some time aside before you go to bed, not sitting on your phone. I know I'm guilty of this sometimes, just sitting there checking some emails or, or you know, messaging someone back and Unfortunately, in Australia, it's daytime when it's nighttime here, so you're always sort of catching up with people just before you're going to bed in the middle of the day. But really making sure you've got you know 30 minutes to an hour before you go to bed to really just take some take some of that stimulation out of your eyes and, and turn your brain off, read a good book, so that you can get you know seven to nine hours of sleep, which is what's recommended. And I think one tip I'm telling a lot of my patients in regards to sleep is use an activity tracker that, that tracks sleep and and know okay, I felt really good today. How much sleep did I get last night? Seven and a half hours. Great. Maybe that's how much sleep I need. Or, hang on, you got 10 hours of sleep and I feel really sluggish today. Maybe you've gone and got too much sleep. So we've got the technology out there to be able to monitor how much we're sleeping and then also know it in ourselves how we feel when we get too much or too little sleep. So just like meal planning, just like exercise planning, you can plan when you sleep as well. Some great points. I have one final question for all three of you because you brought up, you know, our trackers. We're all wearing our different kinds of trackers these days. And I do think that the pandemic has made us everyone be a little bit more or a lot more aware of how to take care of ourselves because of the added stress. So we've learned, we're really learning about how important sleep, sleep is, about nutrition, about exercise about mindfulness and also about being accountable, setting goals, planning, all of these things and tracking ourselves, learning about our bodies. And my hope is that it sets our communities up so that we're all much more aware of the control that we have over how we feel. And that maybe, the well, here's the glass half full, maybe down the road, there will be decreases in hypertension and diabetes and chronic diseases because we're all paying more attention to our own health rather than just living in this rat race. So maybe that's the, I'm hoping for some good from this pandemic, trying my hardest. Um, 
So I guess I would love to hear from each of you and, and we'll reverse it. We'll go Jordan, Kaylee, Brendan. Um, what are your hopes after the challenging year we've had and let's think past the vaccine and, and moving to the next stage, how do you think this pandemic will change our community in a good way for how we lead our lives? I think it's just really opened up so many more levels of communication between people. And I think I got really frustrated at the start of the pandemic when they were calling it socially isolating, because I think no one should have been socially isolating. They, they should have been physically isolating, but still reaching out to people and talking to people and, and you know, FaceTime, Zoom, um, you know, Microsoft Teams, exactly like what we're doing now. There are so many more ways to talk to people and communicate with people. I really hope that's something that continues forward as well and access to telehealth. Just knowing that, you know, we're not just, hey, I'm gonna go catch up with this person for an hour. I can actually call someone on the phone or FaceTime or um, just still be able to, to talk to someone without actually having to be with them. I think that's really important. Great points. And I think too, we've seen the studies come out that show the importance of social and in, social interactions. Um, and how important they are for our health. And now we've seen all the different ways we can do it. And um, it'll be, I look forward to seeing that continuing on in the, in the healthcare realm as well. Kaylee. Yeah, I think I just, I really hope that people are learning how to really prioritize themselves and prioritize their health and not just be like, oh man, I should work out more and have physical fitness, but that emotional fitness piece and tapping into their resources and really digging deep and reflecting on who they have as their support system. And if you have a limited support system, you have your physical therapists, you have your mental health counselors, you have your PCPs, your, you know, your doctors, just like really dig deep um, and know that there are, that we are here for you guys. And I hope that people are learning that and come out stronger and healthier after all this. Thanks, Kaylee. And last but not least, and certainly not the slowest, Brendan. Um, I, I think m my hopes for the community are, are pretty similar to what, what uh, Jordan and Kaylee both just kind of went through. But I think one thing that spending the better part of a year having things be so different is my hopes are that people will kind of, um, I guess, learn to not take for granted the things that we did before in terms of um, how easy it is in, under normal circumstances when we can get closer back to that to, to maybe take care of yourself like if you can find a way to work out at home using you know a bag of rice as resistance and you know doing things with no equipment that once you do have access to the gym or or even just a, a, a larger group to work out with for the accountability that you kind of make it a priority and, and really think about wow like i i really do have like a lot of good opportunities to take care of myself in this way um, and I would say another one is um, a lot of people that maybe haven't had to necessarily deal with um, serious issues with like anxiety or depression. Now, maybe this might be the first time this has really become a big issue for them, kind of coinciding with a kind of lack of a social support or or I guess um, kind of like Jordan was, was saying, you know, maybe being a little bit isolated, we should make sure we're not socially distant from each other because we do have the technology and the opportunities to stay in touch with each other. So I, I do hope going forward that in addition to taking care of ourselves, we are also uh, taking advantage of our social connections and how easy it is to check in on a friend or a family member who might be going through a tough time because even though we have this shared experience of COVID, you know, once life goes back to normal, people are still gonna go through rough times and it's important to, to make sure we keep those social bonds strong because it's easy to think about other people when we're all going through the same rough times right now, but it might not always be that way in the future. Great point. So we're looking for a more empowered, more empathetic community and people willing to be accountable for their own health. Um, I think the future looks great. It's gonna be a tough winter, a tough holiday season. And um, Jordan, Kaylee, Brendan, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. So many great tips. I do hope the listeners out there, please commit 
to whether it's one, two, or 10 of the tips that have come out of today's webinar, today's podcast. Utilize these, get, utilize these as gifts, gifts to take care of yourselves. It's really important to stay strong, take each day as it comes, but do the best you can to, to be well and take care of yourself through, during this most challenging time. And know that um, and sometime in 2021, we'll develop this sort of new normal. And I'm sure we'll all have a greater appreciation for the wonderful things that we do have access to then. So good health, happy holidays to all of you. And again, thank you to listeners out there. Please know we're here to help and support you. Please feel free to reach out to us with any stories, any questions. We're continuing to put out daily information to help you all stay um, healthy and to get through this pandemic as a community. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Peace, guys.